Although academia would like you to believe they possess a detailed, complete history regarding the construction of Easter Island, just like any other seemingly impossible site found around the world, any explanation as to how these supposedly documented events were indeed undertaken remains absent. We recently postulated that much of the ancient ruin that is Easter Island and perhaps the most impressive features still to be found upon the island are more than likely buried beneath past landslides once caused by rapid deforestation. And, as predicted, with this realized and archaeological excavations commenced, we soon knew just how deep this ancient sediment actually is. And as such, the controversial discoveries began to surface. Not only are there ancient Moai statues, stretching into the hundreds of tons of weight dotting the island, but how these were moved into position is knowledge lost to the chasm of history. However, although academia would like you to believe that these tasks were completed within the last thousand years, the evidence of a past advanced civilization actually having been responsible is all over the island. After shallow excavations were undertaken around Anahu, one of the many ancient ceremonial platforms, polygonal masonry, uncannily similar to that found within Giza, Peru, Bolivia, and indeed all other as yet unexplained sites around the world, was indeed unearthed. An additional piece of evidence we feel may one day help to eventually unravel the mystery of not only Easter Island, but many other ancient sites around the world, is in its past title. Once known as the navel of the world, it is interestingly one of many. A number of other ancient sites, thanks to our own more modern ancestors, retain their ancient titles as navels. Were these ancient civilizations somehow able to tap into a mysterious energy grid that can be found crisscrossing our Earth? It is undeniable that many of the most ancient sites found all over the planet can be found located upon purported ancient energy lines. Were these placements a mere coincidence? Were they placed there for another reason? Or were they indeed tapping into an energy field which allowed them to shift such weights? Chipito Chenua is an intriguing artifact that can be found upon the island. With such an extremely well-preserved, untouched history found upon the island, Chupito Chenua is still remembered as an artifact once used by ancient elders, used to summon something called mana, which interestingly translates as earth energy. These elders then inexplicably use this energy to float multi-ton statues across the coastline, placing them in their final resting places. Are all these connections, artifacts, and historical accounts mere coincidence? Or are we truly on to something? Only time will tell. Alex Putney over at humanresonance.org has, for a number of years now, been unraveling some rather startling secrets. Secrets surrounding Nikola Tesla's free energy technologies and the systematic suppression thereof and seemingly deciphering a number of astounding ancient discoveries, all of which strongly indicating once highly advanced knowledge of sound waves, resonance, and indeed levitation of extremely large weights. Coined as the, quote, piezoelectric basins by Alex himself, it seems he, along with a number of other researchers' exhaustive efforts, have discovered some compelling and intriguing characteristics of many ancient ruins which litter most of Egypt, dotted along the banks of the Nile. We have, in the past, touched upon the possibility of sound resonance having been a factor in Edward Leedskalen's mysterious and secretive construction of Coral Castle, which can be found within Florida. Many believe that Edward somehow unraveled the secrets to the pyramids, and in doing so, was able to recreate his own rudimentary resonance machine, enabling him to lift enormous weights with relative ease. As our knowledge of our environment and the mysteries of our ancestors deepens, especially regarding their once mystifying and astounding knowledge of construction, 
left to ruin in many areas of the world, accepted as having never had access to heavy machinery, we must look elsewhere for our answer as to how these weights were moved. An outspoken local wisdom keeper of the Giza Plateau, Egyptologist and tour guide Abdel Hakim Ayan, has brought very controversial but extremely compelling knowledge to bear regarding profound implications of these astounding ancient constructions. Hakim's provocative commentary on the misconceptions of modern academics was broadcast in The Pyramid Code, a documentary produced by Dr. Carmen Bolter, professor at the University of Calgary, a documentary well worth investigation. It reveals several insights, including the advanced nature of the psychoacoustic and biorhythmic effects of these ancient Sanskrit monuments that he claims have all been falsely attributed to the Egyptian civilization. Part of his testimony is as follows. It must be noted that due to Abdel's intimate knowledge of the Giza Plateau, he should undoubtedly be perceived as a reliable source of avenues for alternative esoteric research. He claims that in 1936, while the Sphinx was still covered up to the neck in sand, there were tunnels he personally explored, claiming that past the Abu Ghraib, a crystal altar was found containing a round disc in the middle of four radial lines, a symbol of Hotep, Hotep meaning peace and food. This round disc was a lid on a shaft, about 180 feet deep to the level of the ocean, where he claims there is still running water, and there is still, quote, much more to be found. There is a place on this planet whose existence was, for many centuries, merely a legend. A tale told amidst the myths of the sea dogs. Surrounded by enormous stone statues, which eternally watch and gaze upon the often misty shore. Lost in the vast depths of the ocean, as if forgotten by the earth. Throughout its long and incredibly rich and unique history, this mystical place gave sanctuary to countless souls many presumably on the verge of perishing. It is an island imbued with the visible hope of the desolate, racing across shark-infested routes from island to island in the small volcanic chain, not just for fun, but kingdom celebrity status. These paradisiacal and familiar lagoons were their entire world. Although there is clear and predictably evidence of the once global, highly capable stonemasons, having had their hand in the mysteries of the statues of the islands, yet post-flood all the stone carving abilities required to cut a mangai hook, for example. After this link was severed, generation after generation, the descendants of the marooned lived out their lives in complete isolation, never seeing their homelands again. Landing on Easter Island would have felt like the death of one life and the beginning of a new. The island was once heavily forested with broadleaf palms for the submersion of many of the moai beneath many meters of soil or possible sediment has been that of rapid deforestation, yet I find it hard to envisage a colony dependent on such a material being so irresponsible with it. Furthermore, why were no seedlings present? Or indeed, ungerminated seeds? Why did these forests not indeed naturally grow back? Why are there so little fragments of Rongorongo, the still undeciphered language of the pre-flood civilization, all of which on wood yet still found upon the island in the late 1900s? And most perplexing of all, why do many of the statues buried up to their necks lay in differing directions? If indeed the top saw was destabilized by the removal of root support, statues would be laying in the same direction. However, due to the island's remote location, if a great deluge was to have occurred, the collection of sediment and differing tidal patterns would explain this higgledy-piggledy layout perfectly. Yet, I digress. Strong evidence suggests at some point post-flood the islanders were introduced to sweet potatoes, becoming a very important staple which probably found its way to the island either with marooned mariners or floating wreckage. Over four major population crashes and famines were reported by the original natives in their knowledge of the island's past. With no outside influences, invasions, or even contact ever experienced by the Easter Islanders, any other colonies were slowly forgotten. 
Only very rare shipwreck events brought incoming information, and many generations could pass without such an event occurring. Christian missionary campaigns on the island became frequent, most of their priceless cultural practices, especially their valuable knowledge of successfully living, completely isolated on a tiny desert island, predictably faded over time. Subsequent slave raids demolished the island's imaginary barrier to the forgotten sorrows of outsiders. Memories built up over generations of safety and solitude was shattered by the slave trade. The pace and ferocity of the modern world swept them away. The mystical, untouched Easter Islanders' luck was to run out. The last king to ever reign over the Kingdom of Easter died a slave along with his family somewhere in Europe. A sad end to an amazing journey. When I first considered covering Easter Island, I looked upon the subject as somewhat bland and boring. But once you peel back the moss and dig out the facts, you stumble across an amazing and true legend among historical tales. By participating in the research of past cultures, we can discover amazing legacies. There are many incredible things our ancestors are willing to tell us if we are willing to look hard enough. As always, thanks for watching. We find such mysterious histories highly compelling.